Uh, good morning, Professor Bala, Mr. Sharma, Professor Shanti, Professor Srinivasan, Professor Sriram, uh, participants, students, faculty, friends. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to deliver this keynote address. I was here at this seminar uh, three years ago when I was still in the RPI. And uh, at that time, I was speaking about financial inclusion, if I recall. Uh, this is now uh, a more relaxed setting for me. It's, uh, uh, it's a chance to sort of sit back a little bit and think about things a little more, in a little more depth and a little more leisure. And uh, having been in a policy-making role uh, in the aftermath of the, of the crisis of 2008, and uh, as many people might say, a crisis that is still continuing, although with very different dimensions and geographies, uh, I thought it would be good to uh, set the tone for this conference on emerging issues uh, by reflecting on the way in which thinking has changed since the crisis. Uh, every crisis is, as uh, the saying goes, both uh, a, a, an opportunity, the challenge is to, to deal with it. Uh, the opportunity is to look at uh, why it happened and how to avoid uh, the same crisis. I think history tells us that Crisis cannot be avoided, but crisis caused by the same factors can be through appropriate learnings from the previous experience. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do in this talk. Uh, so I'm going to focus on some lessons learned in different domains of, of macroeconomics and finance, and then use that as a basis to talk about paradigm shifts. In what fundamental ways uh, is this crisis likely to impact thinking? Uh, you may recall the famous uh, response of uh, Karl Marx to the question, uh, what did he think about the French Revolution? And uh, this was, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years after that, I guess. Not, sorry, not no, 50 years after the revolution. And he said it's too early to tell. And, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, intellectual evolution is also extremely unpredictable and difficult to pinpoint. So who knows how these paradigm shifts are going to play out. Uh, they may uh, not even be complete before the next crisis hits. It's a continuing evolution of thinking. But we do have some, I think, fairly clear trends in thinking that have emerged from the crisis. And uh, that's what I want to focus on. So I'm going to start with talking about some lessons, uh, use that as a framework to, to talk about uh, paradigm shifts. Uh, and highlight some shifts that seem to have taken place after 2008. Uh, many of the points that uh, Shanti made in her opening remarks, I think, get covered by this, uh, this discussion. And I'll conclude with a few key messages. Let me begin by uh, categorizing lessons. This is not an exhaustive list. It uh, is just a reflection of my domain. Uh, monetary policy, financial regulation, corporate governance, and then more generally on the issue of globalization. Uh, four key lessons that I like to draw from the experience of the crisis uh, in terms of how monetary policy works and what the limitations to monetary policy are. Uh, the first is the notion of the great moderation. Uh, this, is an, this is a term that was used to describe what appeared to be a phenomenal success of monetary policy, which is that for two decades or so, uh, after uh, the early 80s and up to the early 2000s, uh, that global inflation was generally quite uh, subdued. And there are many factors that went into this, but one uh, source or one uh, factor that was given great credit for this was the ability of monetary policy to manage inflation in a way that did not uh, hamper or impede growth. So maintaining that balance between growth and inflation uh, 
uh, you may recall uh, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, Alan Greenspan, who was chairman for 18 years and uh, was at that point given great credit for having somehow found this, uh, this very uh, stable balance. Uh, once the crisis precipitated, uh, a view, the view of him changed somewhat, and uh, one reason for that change of view was the realization that if you manage the growth inflation balance with appropriate amounts of monetary stimulus, uh, low commodity inflation did not mean that asset prices are not going to be affected. And what we did see over that period, particularly in the later part of that two-decade long period, was uh, the massive increase in asset prices. So this was taken, of course, as a great success, and perhaps it was, because everybody complains about commodity prices rising, uh, but nobody complains about asset prices rising. As long as you believe that those asset prices are going to stay up or continue to rise forever, it's a great achievement, it's a great feeling. Everybody's getting richer. But uh, the perception that uh, this was going to be an endless ride obviously turned out to be somewhat uh, flawed, and at some point the cycle reversed itself. But what came out of this experience and the lesson that monetary policy, uh, I think, has learned is that uh, somewhere the inflationary pressure is going to show up. If you have a certain amount of liquid in the system, it may not be showing up in the form of higher commodity prices, rising commodity prices, but it certainly is showing up then in, in, the, uh, in the outcome or in the manifestation of rising asset prices, and that does create its own problems. Uh, the second lesson, which uh, I think is very important and, in fact, underlies uh, the response of the Fed and other central banks uh, in the form of extremely aggressive liquidity uh, responses, uh, is a very thin line between illiquidity and insolvency. Now, this, this is a terminology which I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with in the corporate finance context, which is a company is illiquid if its current assets and liabilities are mismatched, but it's insolvent if its long-term assets and liabilities are mismatched. And you can actually translate this into a macroeconomic uh, context as well. And some of the issues that uh, Professor Bala referred to uh, driving the rupee may actually smack of this thin line between illiquidity and insolvency. But what happens here is that an illiquid company or an illiquid economy, and we may be talking about one such ourselves, uh, can actually become insolvent because there are genuine spillovers, real spillovers, from the short term to the long term. There are other ways to describe this, a term called hysteresis, which you may have heard. But essentially, uh, as liquidity pressures prolong, and, and get entrenched, uh, they start to have real effects. They start to impact on production, they start to impact on demand, they start to impact on investment, they start to have all kinds of consequences which will, which will uh, uh, persist. And uh, the solution there then is try and nip the illiquidity problem in the bud. It's very important to push liquidity into the system as a short-term solution. It's not going to solve your problems uh, forever. It's not going to be a permanent or robust solution, but you have to buy time. And QE is a very important example of the use of liquidity as a measure that buys. Uh, it succeeded, uh, but I think, again, uh, to, to keep going back to Karl Marx, you know, maybe it's too early to tell. Uh, the third and related lesson is the uh, realization that monetary policy obviously has some very hard constraints, some obvious limits. You can't reduce interest rates below zero. Bank, central banks would not typically pay other banks to borrow from them. Nobody would pay you to borrow from, uh, from them. But uh, does that mean that that is the end of monetary policy? We've reached the zero lower bound, can't reduce interest rates anymore. This is in a context when, for through the great moderation, uh, interest rates had become recognized and accepted as really the only tool of monetary policy, that all other tools that were used historically were seen as sort of inefficient and therefore not uh, really something that needed to be used in normal circumstances. So everybody had moved to a policy rate instrument, 25 basis points up, 25 basis points down, whatever it is. 
But now you're faced with a situation where there is uh, no space. And yet, uh, macroeconomic conditions clearly uh, continuation of a monetary stimulus. So this is where a return to uh, instruments that were traditionally used, and here clearly liquidity was the key one. Uh, there are different ways to introduce liquidity into the system. Different economies have uh, different capacities and different channels. But eventually, and certainly when we look at uh, the experience between late 2008 and about every central bank in the every significant central bank, perhaps every central bank, basically responded to the very uh, in economic activity. These, of course, have consequences down the road, and uh, some of us uh, paid the price for that. But uh, again, the concern is, uh, do you use instruments that you have just to save the situation, even if this means later uh, trouble? And often that's a dilemma that uh, we face uh, in other situations as well. For example, uh, you might call this uh, an emergency room analogy, where uh, if a patient goes into an emergency room, uh, the doctor's mandate there is to save the patient's life, keep him alive, uh, do, do whatever it takes. You might break his ribs, you might puncture his lung, you might poke a hole in his throat, whatever it is. These things can do damage later. These things can have consequences later. But at that moment, it is simply a matter of compulsion of keeping things alive, keeping the person alive. And policy response has some of that element as well. And finally, the emergence of uh, communication as an explicit and now perhaps more and more a formal tool of uh, monetary policy. It's always been talked about in uh, some vague way that what central bankers say uh, is, a, is in itself a policy instrument. But from the Greenspan paradigm to the uh, Bernanke paradigm, uh, Greenspan was, uh, was uh, identified with a phrase called constructive ambiguity, which is let keep the market guessing. Don't, don't give any explicit signals. Let them make what they want of your messages. Don't say anything that can be interpreted with complete unambiguity. That position has now, I think, been transformed to don't keep confusing the markets, because that may actually hurt. So Bernanke's model, and that was best ex exemplified by his uh, articulation of benchmarks, that we will start withdrawing QE when unemployment reaches 6.5% and uh, CPI inflation reaches 2% or some such very explicit uh, numbers, parameters, uh, which actually indicate to the market, look, this is something to watch out for. We know what he's going to do when that happens, so let's start to, uh, to anticipate and, and uh, make our decisions accordingly. Uh, again, it's, it's not clear whether this is, a bet this is a better way or you know, the previous uh, the ambiguity was better, but by and large, central banks have moved from fuzziness and uh, in almost intended, uh, not, if not confusion, at least uh, ambivalence to now much more explicit, uh, much more uh, formal uh, statements of intent and expected outcomes. So this is a very, very significant change in the monetary policy toolkit, uh, which, from my viewpoint, I think is a huge improvement. But again, there's a debate out on this. On financial regulation, uh, the, this is, I think, something that everybody saw was going on. But it's only when institutions collapsed that uh, people realized that banks had now become much more than what people thought banks were. And essentially, that meant that the balance sheet risk had shifted very significantly from credit risk, which is pay you back. Now you have ways of defending yourself against that by provisioning and so on, to market risk, where you have a bunch of assets on your uh, balance sheet, which are marked to market, and every time the value goes down, you take the loss. So if you have a lot of such assets and the market value falls dramatically, which happened during the crisis, then without anything fundamentally going wrong with your business model, your balance sheet has become completely defunct. Uh, so banks that have a large amount of, balance, of market risk on their balance sheet uh, 
proved to be particularly vulnerable in the situation. In fact, we're at the corners, we're at the center of the way the crisis unfolded and how it spread from specific institutions through the system. Uh, the second lesson that I think is quite important is uh, the, uh, the flip side of securitization. Uh, securitization is a great instrument. It is a great innovation. And it was used particularly uh, extensively in the US uh, when it came to spreading risk uh, of uh, exposures to housing in particular, uh, but also other uh, you know, channels of lending. And the best thing about it is that uh, it takes a certain amount of risk and spreads it very evenly, very thinly across the system. Now, what happened with the uh, with securitization in the prelude to the crisis? Uh, we moved from what is called pooling, which is the first generation of securitization, uh, to tranching, which is taking up into uh, different risk buckets or risk categories. So the same pool of risk is essentially differentiated in terms of some rating methodology, uh, which allows or the differentiation between high risk and low risk components of that, of that pool. Now here is where the problem arose, because this methodology proved to be inadequate. I, I, I don't want to get into the, the, uh, the discussion on the ratings, but basically, what, hap what appear to be high risk or rather low risk or highly rated pool, uh, tranches turned out to have essentially the same risk characteristics as the low rated ones. So when they started melting down, they all started melting down together, which then spread to balance sheets and market, mark to market losses and so on. The whole thing just cascaded. So I think we have to recognize that securitization has its value, but it also has its limits and find uh, the best way to use it as opposed to perhaps you know, completely shutting it down, which, of course, there is a temptation to do. Uh, the third lesson I want to emphasize is the completely interlinked nature of the financial system. There is no more banks and others. Uh, and this is really uh, a reflection of the obsolescence of a regulatory framework that focuses exclusively on one or the other component of the system. So we know that banks are very well regulated. Uh, in every country, banks are subject to very stringent and very formal regulation. But many components of the financial system are not. But when banks are linked to those components, either because the regulatory pressures drive them to, or because that is the nature of how financial business is uh, developing, ultimately the interlinkage means one failure can cascade through the system. It's a domino uh, problem risk. and we saw that happen. Now, the too big to fail, the, the title of the book and then the movie that uh, Professor Bala referred to, basically suggests that if institutions are systemically critical, if the linkages they have are so thick and so dense and so widespread that any trouble with them will immediately uh, cascade through the system, then there is a compulsion, a public policy compulsion to keep them alive. And here is where the great moral hazard emerges. You want to grow to that point where you're ensured that you will be protected. And therefore, do you, do you have to, in some ways, contain that, disincentivize that kind of growth? And finally, on asset diversification, uh, you were uh, told about uh, trading and uh, trading strategies. Uh, one thing that the crisis demonstrated was that assets that are sort of negatively correlated during normal times and therefore provide the basis for a, uh, an effective diversified trading strategy, uh, switch. And you find that all assets plunging at the same time when there's crisis. And this essentially drives from, from the liquidity problem, the liquidity constraint. So diversification actually provides you no know, defense against a market collapse. Everything fails. And if that happens, then you really never have enough protection in a portfolio against a crisis. You can never hedge yourself out of a crisis. And this is something which caused enormous damage across portfolios of people who thought, well, you know, we've, 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 we've diversified across geographies, across asset classes, across durations, across everything, so we're completely safe. And then it turns out that you're not because everything falls together. On corporate governance, key lessons, one, that most organizations, large organizations, 
particularly in the financial sector, I think, in, uh, as exemplified by the crisis, but uh, also generally, uh, have become so complex that uh, nobody quite knows uh, what they're doing. Uh, in many of the narratives of uh, the bank failures or the, the collapse of financial institutions, it often came out that the CEO, the management council, the executive committee, didn't even understand what many of the, the trading desks or the investment uh, groups were doing, and they just didn't have the time to be either briefed uh, on the technicality or pay much attention to this because there are so many things going on. So there is a, not only a bandwidth issue, which means that you don't prioritize many things and things can slip under the, the radar, but also uh, uh, an understanding, a comprehension issue. So are you doing things in the organization which the management is hard-pressed to even comprehend, forget about you know, having detailed knowledge about, uh, most, most management don't need detailed knowledge, but they need to have some sense of what's going on, and that seemed to be at a, uh, at a, uh, a low level here, an inadequate level. Uh, very important uh, issue on incentives which is uh, most incentive systems tend to be asymmetric. We have uh, a lot of reward for good performance, for, for delivery of, uh, of profit, but we have no corresponding or proportionate penalties for non-delivery, for losses. And uh, we see this happening so often where the most recently the JP Morgan incident where uh, two, two uh, members of the trading team were held accountable for not disclosing losses uh, because uh, while they, would, they were they are now perhaps going to serve prison terms or some legal action going on, but uh, basically the the incentive to uh, to sh keep showing profits uh, is very high. Uh, but uh, you know if you if you are doing that with higher and higher risk taking, which is what is happening, you're not getting penalized for that higher risk. So sometimes it can just explode on you. Uh, the third lesson is uh, the always threatens a paradigm. A crisis always challenges it and forces some sort of rethink. Now, are we on the threshold of a new paradigm? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. And I'll sort of conclude on that note. But clearly, the macro financial globalization thought process after the crisis, based on those lessons in particular, is fundamentally different from the way it was viewed before the crisis. And I think that's a very important uh, basis for both policy making and for research, because ultimately we have to understand that when a paradigm is displaced, uh, there's no guarantee that the one that succeeded, succeeds it is robust, is, uh, is, uh, sort of is appropriate to the, to the role. Uh, and uh, so the emergence of a strong alternative is critical for a successful displacement. I think that's really the role of researchers in particular, uh, questioning the old one and bringing new perspectives to bear uh, to, to help shape a new paradigm. So a few illustrations of this. Uh, the idea that the Keynesian revolution, that, that was a fundamental, absolutely, I think, exemplifying uh, paradigm shift uh, when thinking changed, you know, almost 180 degrees on the role of the state, on what the state could do in terms of an economic impact. Uh, a slightly perhaps less uh, prominent one, but very significant nevertheless, is the Friedman and then the Lucas, the, the monetary revolution, which brought expectations into play and actually challenged the Keynesian perception on monetary policy uh, quite substantially and very successfully because the Keynesian model was proved to be faulty when inflation became a huge problem in the Western economies. Uh, financial regulation, we are clearly seeing a change from opportunity and from innovation and from sort of boundless kind of uh, wealth to be created from innovation to now risks and, and limitations and costs. Uh, and so that balance, a balance seems to be restored there. And globalization, for 20 years, we thought it was uh, the ultimate uh, development model, the ultimate development engine. And now suddenly we're starting to look at it as not just a series of opportunities, but a series of threats as well. So let me just uh, now highlight some lessons uh, or, or some elements of the paradigm shift uh, in these four domains. Uh, on monetary policy, 
dominant paradigm before the crisis, I've already mentioned this single focus, inflation targeting was, was the big, uh, the big uh, uh, model, the, the prominent model, and the use of interest rates uh, alone. Uh, and now we're moving to more integration, uh, financial and external stability considerations have come back into monetary policy reckoning. This may be a re return, but it's still a paradigm shift. Uh, the use of instruments beyond interest rates, liquidity and communication. Uh, monetary policy was seen as a separate and distinct function. Central banks in many countries were split up between the monetary functions and the regulatory functions. There is a move to reintegrate them. The most visible example of this is the Bank of England, which has brought the financial supervision, the banking supervision function back from the Financial Services Authority back into the Bank of England. Uh, reason for this is that the central bank is the only entity within the system that can provide liquidity. And if you don't know you, the entities uh, that require the liquidity, if you are not observing them, uh, you may, may not be able to do the uh, do the right thing. So bringing that back into the uh, the monetary scope uh, was, was seen as one way to deal with this. And finally, on the shift between uh, short term and long term, this comes back to this illiquidity and insolvency issue that uh, central banks are inconsistent. That is, they're doing things that have negative consequences in the long term, but are absolutely necessary to save the situation in the short term. So you can be criticized for doing the wrong thing if you're looking at a three-year or five-year horizon, but then the answer to that is, well, who's, who cares about the three-year or five-year horizon when you, you are facing a survival problem today? And so this time inconsistency problem has now become, I think, uh, subsumed by this balance between short-term and long-term risks. Uh, on the financial regulation, we now have a new term uh, in the vocabulary, it's called macroprudential regulation, uh, moving from individual banks and institutions to the system as a whole, uh, interlinkages, liquidity, overall system liquidity, all of these uh, tools are, are being brought into play. Uh, we had segmentation in terms of, uh, of uh, institutions, banks versus others. Now we're talking about system regulation, which is looking at all of the linkages. And this has brought into uh, uh, brought into the scene uh, concepts of or mechanisms or institutions uh, which, which are coordinatory in nature. Uh, we have the Financial Stability and Development Council. The U.S. has the Financial Stability uh, Coordination Committee or something like that, which is actually a, a bringing together regulators across the system to take a holistic and a, a sort of a, a composite view of the system. Uh, derivatives are a huge issue. Uh, we're moving slowly to uh, at least disclosure, that is uh, transparency of derivatives in the form of uh, a trading platform or a, or a disclosure platform. So prices are known, prices of all derivatives are known uh, to the market uh, as opposed to these being bilateral transactions. But their, their value as hedges uh, is clearly being tempered by their uh, the view that they're also a source of risk. And we're moving from a uniform capital buffer model to a Basel III plus kind of model, which is capital buffers proportionate to risk. You don't know whether proportionality is, is not based on any sort of firm uh, science, but it's a judgment that different institutions have different levels of risk, and therefore they need to be treated differently uh, in terms of capital buffers. Uh, on corporate governance, Straightforward lessons, and I don't see this as a paradigm shift, but more a reinforcement of basic principles, uh, increased transparency and disclosure to all stakeholders. Uh, organizational structures being simplified, easier said than done. But I think what's very important in the, and I, this is an explicit issue in the G20 agenda, uh, which is to make the incentive system symmetric. You as much as you reward people for delivery of profit, you have to penalize them for taking on risks beyond uh, the boundaries. And finally, on globalization, uh, uh, 20 years of uh, supremacy of the view that capital movements must be free are now making way for some room for controls, uh, as again exemplified by the IMF's change of view on this, that.
there are some situations in which capital controls may be warranted, but of course there are good controls and bad controls. Uh, domestic dominance or the dominance of domestic factors in deciding monetary and giving way to a global da dashboard. Every central bank and every ministry of finance is not just looking at their own internal situation, they're also looking at what's going on in the rest of the world before they make their policy decisions. And uh, that makes things a lot more complicated because, you know, just understanding the implications of all of this is becoming uh, enormously challenging. And finally, on the, on the idea that global capital markets require global regulation, not easy to achieve institutionally, but there is some segmentation going on on what are called global SIFIs, globally, globally systemically important financial institutions. So these are getting a special category of uh, treatment, which is that they will be uh, the different uh, higher levels of uh, prudential standards, capital buffers essentially, will be imposed on them. There is, of course, debate and, and disagreement on what the criteria should be and so on, but essentially that differentiation is starting to f uh, find its way into the policy uh, domain. Let me conclude uh, with some general observations. Uh, there's no question that the crisis did challenge paradigms in all of these areas and perhaps some more. And as a result of that, as a result of uh, thinkers, whether in the academic world or in the policy world or in the business world, uh, starting to get to grips with this, uh, a paradigm shift is clearly visible. We are starting to see a very different approach to many of these things uh, than was the case before the crisis. Uh, but here, uh, what I call the fallacy of opposites is a big risk because what that says is that just because X is the problem uh, doesn't mean that X is the opposite of X is the solution. And very often in, in the absence of any analytical uh, foundation, uh, because you think something's causing a problem, just do the opposite and it solves the problem. Uh, policy does get made in that fashion, and uh, it, it does pose some risk. So the, the uh, creation of an analytical foundation, I think uh, that's my final point, uh, that uh, allows for this alternative paradigm to emerge in a robust fashion, which provides answers to the problems that the earlier paradigm could not, uh, whether it's with respect to monetary policy or financial regulation or... Uh, or uh, globalization or corporate governance, uh, really the fundamental role of researchers in this process. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you found this useful.